Our scripture readings this morning, the first one comes from the 133rd Psalm. Hear now the word of God. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Our second reading comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed, a preacher and an apostle, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Why I don't preach about political opinion. I, I am not holding a universally accepted position for pastors. You will meet many who preach their opinion about any given issue, and many of them preach week to week, so the sermons aren't necessarily in a series. It allows you to just flex if something happens. If there's a storm or a crisis, they can preach about it. Uh, you might think that I don't do uh, cast an opinion out of fear. Um, that is certainly not the case. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm happy to and operate. Uh, but it's a, it's a fair supposition. Maybe you're just afraid. I want you to actually just go on a journey with me to where it actually started from how I preach the way I reach and why I don't do these things. Meaning, preach my opinion on pick a topic that you're riled up about. Just in your head, go to that one. Maybe it's recent with, with uh, Supreme Court rulings. A few weeks before that, it's related to something else. But you've got one that you're hot about. And imagine if, if I got up and said, well, here's my interpretation and opinion about that. And again, there are pastors and churches who do that. The reason goes back to 1994. Does anyone remember what you were doing in 1994? Some of you weren't born, fair enough. There's the cover of Time Magazine in 1994. It's all about the internet, the strange new world of the internet. Can you imagine a time when we thought about the internet as being strange and new? That was 28 years ago. I had been in ministry for two years. Stunned me when I did the math. I've always said, oh, I've been in ministry about 25 years. 30 years I've been in ministry. I was a youth director for two years, and it was my second year. I had a 1990 uh, Alfa Romeo Spider Veloce convertible. I loved that car. I had long hair, and I looked fabulous. <laughs> I was footloose and fancy free, was single, could do whatever I want, and ministry was good. A gentleman came to me and said that he wanted to have coffee with me. He was a Pentecostal preacher whose son was in our youth group. He came and sat down and talked to me and said, I've noticed something about your ministry. The reason I liked this particular pastor is he would always say, if he felt like God was nudging him, he would come and say it, but he would sort of broker it by saying, this may not be God. So just be aware, I, I feel like God's compelling me to talk to you. And he said, I've noticed that my son goes to your youth group. You know, we don't I normally worship here. And a lot of the kids are different. And at the time, the youth group wasn't that big. It was growing. But he just said, there's a lot of different kids in the band and sports. And my son talks about how he's made friends with people he, he normally wouldn't talk to. And he said, I wonder if you would think about something. Out of the blue, he said... Um, God is telling me, maybe you should register to vote as an independent. And I was like, what, what does this have to do with anything? It's the craziest thing someone's ever advised me to do. 
And he said, because I think 10 or 20 or 30 years or 40 years from now, you may be a pastor who's called to hold the center in churches that have different political opinions. Now, I could not have known at the time that 30 years later, in an interview here, to come here, I said, my calling is not to divide churches over political opinion. I like being in a church that's purple. A little bit of red, a little bit of blue. Everybody has to live together. I think it reflects something. Now, I couldn't have known that then. But within a few months, and I thought nothing of it, I, he asked me to pray about it. He never followed up. I prayed and, with him and then forgot about it. Within a few months, I had purchased a new townhouse, and I got and that card asked me to register to vote, confirming what my party was. And I remember not being able to check what I'd be checked before. I had never paid attention to it. I'd always gotten the card, updated my address, whatever I do. I, I don't remember the details, but I remember the feeling. I registered as an independent. Today, we're not talking about political opinion. We're not. We're talking about calling. It's today's main idea. Would you look at it with me and say it with me? Understand the importance of your calling. Now, notice your is highlighted. Yours, not mine. Understand the importance of your calling. You have a unique divine appointment from God based on how you're shaped, based on your giftedness and experience, but also who Holy Spirit is calling you to become. And it's going to give you permission to do things, and it's going to give you permission to not do things. And let me just assure you, the phrase, you can't please all people all the time, it's true. Now that, that thought of calling, I want to ask you to hold it. Just hold it. Do you believe that you have a divine calling from God that changes your outlook on everything? Because if you don't, I want to just assure you, there will be things that you hold on to with rigidity that in the scheme of things are silly. You will hold on to things that take the place of a calling because that's what you got instead of a calling. Hold the thought and pray with me. Holy Spirit, as we look at these texts, we trust that you will speak to us, each of us, as one family called to be the family at San Pedro. It's your church. It's a Christian church. We trust that you're speaking to us. What does it mean to belong here at this church? What does it mean to belong to your family that's global and universal? Holy Spirit, awaken one simple truth, at least in us today. You have a calling for each woman and man in this place. And it's a bold one. A new way of thinking and living that comes from you. In Jesus' name, in dependence upon Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, amen. We look at the first text to dwell together in unity. And you can see my little phrasing there. It says for brothers, but obviously they mean the family of God. How good it is, the psalmist writes, when God sees believers united in ministry. Look at this phrase from John Calvin. We are not our own. Unity does not come from one another. It comes from belonging to God. When you know who you belong to, there is a different kind of confidence and there is a different kind of grace. I want to encourage you to think about, something's wrong with my microphone, I'm going to get it though. Remember the church is united under God. If you look at this next phrase, we think about being united and we think about being united under God. And John Calvin makes the point of saying, we don't belong to ourselves. If this is important to God, it's important to you and me. We look at this phrase that maybe we branch over, go back just one real quick. Remember the church is united under God. It means that God's authority leads each one of us. If you're still with me, say I'm still here. I can assure you it would be easier to preach my political opinion. There would be a Band-Aid. 
It's a brief band-aid. Many of my friends do it when they go to a church. They just let people know, this is who I am. Band-aid pulls off. Some people leave, but the people who come are now homogenous around that viewpoint. There is nothing wrong with that if you're called to do it. It's easier. What's harder is to say, if, if we're under God and we're following a calling, it's not what I want, it's what God wants. Who is God calling you to be? Not what do you want, but what God wants. And there's a way it looks as we move forward through these texts. What are some areas of agreement? Can we just get on a starting point? When we, before we talk about political issues, one-on-one, -on -one, my door is always open. I'm happy to listen. I hope you're happy to listen. I hope that when you hear my, ish, my beliefs on any particular issue, it doesn't make you just get up and walk out the door. If you're coming in, my father loves this joke. He loves this joke. He's been a pastor for 45 years. Whenever someone comes to him and says, what's your opinion about, and then they, they lay out the issue, he says, I, I'm happy to tell me, what's yours? And they'll say it, and he said, I agree with you. <laughs> because they're, they're basically making a stand to say, if you don't agree with me, I'll leave. Let's agree about prayer. Can we agree that this is important? That we're, when we talked about being in a season of prayer for a few months, it kind of lands with kind of a whimper. All right, we're going to do this big thing. I said a few months ago, we're going to be in a season of prayer. Okay. Can we agree that this is actually a game changer for everyone who chooses to do it? It's a world changer if Christians agree to do it. We agree about prayer. The first thing I want you to do, we read in Timothy... Another version of the text you heard today, pray every way you know how for everyone you know, not just political leaders. Everyone you could think of, you should pray for. Everyone. Are we in agreement that this is a good starting point to build unity under God? Not to agree on every issue, but to agree on a core practice. A praying church is different because the people are different. It is a reflective way of being. When you pray for more than five minutes, your mind wanders to things. You examine things. You wonder why certain things anger you. You begin to have a communion where something nudges you to maybe be a different person. It's God in prayer. We agree about prayer. We read a little further. Pray especially for rulers and governments, all these things. Look, this is pleasing to God. This is the way our Savior God wants us to live. Paul was suffering. The Apostle Paul who wrote this suffered. Imagine the temptation under suffering to pray. Let's pray that God would destroy everyone in authority. Can you imagine the temptation when you've seen transformative power to ask God, unleash that power so life is easier for me? Instead, what Paul calls us to is a life of prayer, even in persecution. The words of Jesus... Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who wrong you. Can't we pray for people who disagree with us then? If we're being asked to pray for people who have wronged us, can we not pray for people who we disagree with? This is the kingdom manifesting on earth. We read about another thing we agree to. We agree about core doctrine. Now, not all doctrine, but summarized one or two or three things, so that when a person joins the church, we recognize that whatever their political beliefs that you would be offended by, whoever they voted for that you would just not be able to look at without spitting, they can belong here if they agree to these basic things. Faith in God. Jesus Christ is Lord of all, and sinfulness is universal. We read... Look, God wants to save people. This is my summary of this whole thing. God wants to do this. He wants to save people. He's striving for it. The main thing, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That phrase sounds so childish until you examine your own heart and consider the ways in which you have not responded in a Christ-like way. We are all becoming something else. Last year, I recognized... That when I, and I, it's given me a whole different perspective about people when they're not in a good mood or grumpy or when they rub me the wrong way. I, I was sick. I had a constant nagging thing. For those of you who noticed, I limped 
fairly significantly on some days. I got sick. I've been dealing with this. I still have it. But a few weeks ago, I felt like I was over it. Just all of a sudden, walking, uh, I was on a bike ride with the youth group. I just felt like my mind has cleared. I feel better. But I recognize that there were times when I was not my best and trying to do my job, trying to be a dad, trying to be a good person, I was more abrupt, more tense. All of us need to examine our lives from the perspective of Jesus, and we need to be more compassionate with people who aren't. Can I get an amen? We need to remember people are going through things. Sometimes it's me that bothers you. Sometimes it's something going on with you. Regardless, we've got to build something that glorifies God. We agree on core doctrines. We agree about prayer. Now notice what, Paul, what the apostle gets to, the writer gets to. This and this only has been my appointed work. He had a calling. Imagine early on all of the things that he could have done. His calling for that time and place was to help birth the church. Paul was a missionary to people who hadn't heard about Jesus. This evangelistic movement was his. What is yours? What is yours right now in this place? What is your calling? How does it define what you do and what you don't do? Are you supposed to do everything in the body of Christ? Are you supposed to be gifted in everything? Or are you sp supposed to know that you're uniquely shaped? And are you listening for Holy Spirit nudges from believers, from God? And are you sharing those nudges with others? Who they are called to be? We read a little further this idea. I want the people in every place to pray without wrath and dissension, in unity. Prayer is a key component. I have tried my whole career to make prayer as exciting and dynamic as I can. I have yet to figure out how to do it until you experience it. Until you experience a spiritual release from prayer. Until you experience the person that God wants you to be in prayer. It's just hard to make it fancy. Do it. Pray more often. Set aside time in the morning. Set aside time in the evening. I've given you formulas, the things that I use. I use a prayer journal. Do what you must to set aside time for prayer. It is essential. It sounds so boring, and let's be candid, people criticize this on social media. Thank you for your thoughts and prayer, but what we really need is believers are called to pray. We're called to prayer and action, but we are called to prayer. Don't let people tell you it's not a pleasing thing to God and a transformative thing for the world. If everybody in the world took five minutes a day just to be quiet and examine themselves, what would it look like? My friend, Pastor Mofid in uh, San Diego, he's an Egyptian pastor, and he grew up in a place where Christians are persecuted. And he said that growing up as a Christian, there were so many days when he just had to, there's a phrase they use, let the dogs bark. What that means is, you know, you've had this happen when you walk down a street and dogs come to the fence and they bark at you behind the fence? Just let them bark. People do that. People attack, criticize, critique. If you've got a calling, you can let the dogs bark to keep your eyes on what God has called you to do. Do you know yours? Embrace a life of sacrificial giving. Can you say that with me? Embrace a life of sacrificial giving. A calling that would please me. I remember being 25 years old and having that Alfa Romeo. I still had a dream because I saw how my father lived as a pastor, simply and humbly. I thought my calling as a finance major in college. Now remember, I had gone to college to do this. I had gone to college to learn how to make money. My goal in life was simple. Make as much 
money as you can, and in my mind, you know, share it with your dad. But it was rooted, it was rooted in love for him. But it was that simple. I remember when my life took a turn. There was a woman who told me, you should go to seminary. I was volunteering at a church. There was a man who told me, you've got to refine your calling as you move forward. All of those people were preparing me for what believers have always known. This life is not your own. It's God's. And it's a sacrificial one. Looking ahead, as we look at vision and things for the future for this church, we've been talking about it for a few months. There's a vision coming for the children's ministry on Sunday morning. We're going to redo the wing. The old children's wing is going to be revamped in the coming weeks. There are things that we have yet to think about that are a picture of the future from elders dreaming about the future. And to tell you that I know God is moving, I have been looking for signs. I've been asking God, just show me something that says, don't worry about that, worry about this. I made this sermon a few weeks ago. You know, the notes were there and everything. This week we got word. How many of you remember Marty Kemp? Some of you do. Some of you don't. Marty was in declining health in her later life. She lived a simple life. She left us a gift, $130,000. Nobody knew that woman had that kind of money. Do you know why she did that? Because she lived a sacrificial life. She could have saved it for herself and spent it on herself. She was thinking about the kingdom beyond her time on earth. You can move mountains if you have a calling. Not just with money, but with spiritual intent. This is for the glory of God. It's a sacrificial life. Can we agree that we're a praying people? Can I get an amen? amen. Can, I, can we get an agreement that core doctrines, simple ones, we agree about the supremacy of Jesus in this place? Can we agree? Can I get an amen? amen? You've got to decide if you agree you have a calling that's different from mine. You've got to decide if you're comfortable in a church where the person next to you is completely different from you on a whole host of ideas. Does that reflect a place you want to grow in faith? Your calling will not always unite people. It will clarify, though, who you're called to be and where you're called to go and what you're called to do right now. And I'm telling you, it's a sacrificial life. It costs something. I encourage you to wrestle with it. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come, and you give the answers that humans cannot. Who do you want each woman and man to be? Do you want a person who's prophetically called to speak on issues that are divisive? Make it clear to him or her. Do you want somebody to be a teacher? Do you want someone to be focused on ministries of nurture and care? Do you want someone to be unleashed into an area they have not imagined with talents and skills they've yet to acquire. Holy Spirit, we turn this process over to you grounded in agreement. You want us to be a praying people. You want us to wrestle through our differences, but to be united under God in Christ at San Pedro. Help us to wrestle with how to be in a world that's opinionated and divided. To be a person of constancy and humility and grace. We pray for all these things and trust that you will illuminate a path for each believer here today. No matter the age, no matter the circumstances. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Amen. Would you take a moment?